Hello. We'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of land and place. We recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of the Huchun, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chuchenyo, speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. Welcome to Nordic Talks at Berkeley, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Strand, and I have the privilege to be the executive director of the Nordic Center here at the University of California, Berkeley, and the executive director of the Center for Responsible Business here at the Berkeley Haas School of Business. Today's Nordic Talks is the myth of the Nordic utopia, social democracy through Afro-Nordic perspectives. For those of you who know me, you may know that I'm often called Mr. Nordic, and here at the Haas School of Business, I teach a suite of courses by the title Sustainable Capitalism in the Nordics, question mark. <laughs> that question mark does a lot of heavy lifting. I often point to sustainability policies and, practi policies and practices from the Nordics to constructively challenge the status quo here in the United States, whether the topic is corporate governance, energy, transportation, child care programs, parental leaves, sustainable innovation, or what have you. I routinely champion policies and practices from the Nordic region as a means to challenge the U.S. However, the Nordics are no utopia, and today's Nordic Talks rightfully shines a critical spotlight on the Nordic region, and we have a panel of esteemed experts to do exactly that. Nordic Talks tether to the U.N. Sustainable Development Goals or the SDGs. The suite of 17 SDGs launched in 2015 represent a framework built upon the definition of sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. The SDGs span our world's most pressing challenges from SDG number one, no poverty, to SDG number 13, climate action, and so much in between. Today's Nordic talk ties to SDG number five, gender equality, SDG number 10, reduced inequalities, SDG number 12, responsible consumption and production, and SDG number 15, life on land. But of course, the SDGs are deeply interconnected, and we could likely connect all the SDGs in our important conversations ahead. Now, before I turn it over to my good colleague, Akasima Newsom, uh, to introduce our esteemed panel, I'd like to recognize my good University of California Berkeley colleague, Persis Sperlow. Today's Nordic Talks is only possible because of Persis' tireless leadership and intellectual might. And on behalf of all of us who undoubtedly will benefit from today's event, I want to say thank you, Persis. And with that, our Nordic Talks begins. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm Associate Director of the Global International and Area Studies Hub here at the UC Berkeley campus. I'm also Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies 
and executive director of the Peter Sather Center for Advanced Study. I am overjoyed on the occasion of this event, the myth of Nordic utopia, social democracy through Afro-Nordic perspectives. As a political science PhD, Cal alum, a nationally and internationally engaged scholar of European politics, I can attest that the critical perspectives of European scholars of color on social democracy have been missing and are greatly needed in the field. Notwithstanding the work of Gloria Wecker, Fatima El Tayeb, Lena Miong, Tobias Subinet, Beth Maina Alberg, Michael McEtrain, and others, the sway of racially homogenous Nordic utopia is a potent one across the social sciences and indeed in North American and West European politics. Thus, it has been challenging to broach the topic of legacies of racism and colonialism in the region personally as a black American scholar. I am grateful for the energy, resources, and hard work of my colleagues on the panel and behind the scenes at the Nordic Center to elevate this important critical uh, scholarship on social democracy through Afro-Nordic perspectives. I now have the honor of introducing our distinguished speakers and moderator for this event. Our first panelist is Dr. Elizabeth Lover hunter Elizabeth received her PhD from UC Berkeley's Department of African American and African Diaspora Studies and is currently interested in making an impact as a research analyst in industry. Elizabeth is a researcher and cultural analyst with expertise in race and gender. She specializes in innovative solutions to old problems by centering marginalized perspectives on historical and contemporary societal issues. Her research reduces crucial gaps between Danish official census data, the actual demographic, and the state's contradicting messages about citizenship and belonging by creating awareness of the cultural status quo. Our second panelist, Dr. <laughs> Our second panelist, Dr. Jasmine Kilke, is a postdoctoral scholar in the Department of African American Studies and African Diaspora Studies here at UC Berkeley. Jasmine is an interdisciplinary scholar of the global politics of blackness with a focus on the Nordic context. Attending to the ways in which ideas about blackness are both circulated transnationally and shaped by local contexts, histories, and material conditions. Her research examines the relationship between racialization, criminalization, and community resistance, informed by black Afrofeminist, critical race, and post-colonial theories. Her current book project, tentatively titled Weaponizing Exceptionalism, Policing Blackness in the Nordic Welfare State, draws on community-engaged ethnography to investigate the racialized politics of crime control in Sweden and its consequences for how African diasporic communities are targeted by, experience, and resist racialized policing. Jasmine's previous work has been published in journals including the Annual Review of Sociology, City and Community, and Meridians. In spring 2024, Jasmine will begin an appointment as assistant professor in the Department of Sociology and Criminology at Howard University. And last but not least, we turn to our moderator, Teju Adisa Farrar. Teju is environmental consultant and co-managing director at Fibers Fund. Teju is a multi-hyphenate environmental equity consultant and facilitator based between Lena Pehoking or Brooklyn 
and Ohlone Land, Oakland. She is the creator and host of the Black Material Geographies podcast and a member of the United Nations Conscious Fashion and Lifestyle Network, supporting work that aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals. Teju is an expert on alternatives and has worked with diverse institutions such as Cooper Hewitt, as well as the United States Embassy of Botswana. She has spoken at several colleges and universities, including Princeton University and the Rhode Island School of Design. Her work supports people, organizations, and companies who are making sustainable futures through textiles, alternative economies, regenerative agriculture, and community-centric organizing. Please join me in thanking our panelists and moderator, and then I will hand the floor over to our moderator, Teju. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes? Okay, I assume you can. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Jasmine. Good to see you through the screen and another screen. My name is Teju, and I am calling in from Lenape Hoking, also known as Brooklyn, New York, and I'm happy to be here moderating this discussion. I am Black Jamaican American, raised primarily in California and also in the Caribbean, and I speak English, and English is the only language I know fluently. Um, I think that's important to say because both Jasmine and Elizabeth are multilingual, so they are literally translating and also figuratively translating throughout this conversation. And there's a lot of limits in language, so I think it's important to talk about myself as a, a native English speaker and only an English speaker. Um, I have lived in five different European countries, of which Denmark is one, and been to almost every Scandinavian country with the exception of Greenland, soon come. Um, so I'm very familiar with Europe as a continent and particularly the region that we know as Scandinavia. And so I want to just start by asking both Elizabeth and Jasmine to share a little bit about your positionality as it relates to defining and distinguishing what is the Nordics and what is Scandinavia. Because obviously we say the Nordics and we think we know what we're talking about, but there's different historical contexts and political contexts. So if you guys could talk about how your identity relates to these constructions um, and how we're defining these constructions. Elizabeth, let's start with you. Okay, hi, and thank you. Um, so I am Danish. And uh, that's the position that I speak from. That's where my knowledge comes from. Um, and yeah, and so I'm part of this Scandinavian cultural community, we can say, where Shasmin uh, and I can just instantly relate to a lot of things because there are some shared Scandinavian myths. And so when I say Scandinavia, I mean Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Finland. Even if Finland is sort of an outsider because of their language that is not close to, uh, to ours. So the three others are close enough for us to be able to have a conversation together if we are patient. And, um, and so the, the Nordics... Um, would also include arguably um, colonized territories such as Greenland um, and Iceland also and the Faroe Islands that are, it's sort of, they're in and out of the conversations when we, when we have these, uh, when we use these larger terms about the Nordics. But the centers of power definitely are within the Scandinavian countries and Denmark and Sweden specifically actually have been sort of uh, historically fighting for who's the greatest um, and having Norway in between them. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, and thank you, Teju, for that question and Elizabeth for, for kind of laying the groundwork there. Um, so my sort of positionality vis-a-vis -vis the Nordics um, gets at this question of Scandinavia versus the Nordics as well as um, I was raised in Finland and 
as Finland Swedish, meaning I have familial and cultural ties to both Finland and Sweden that are produced by the histories of kind of um, imperial expansionism in the Nordics. Um, and so from the Finnish kind of standpoint, that distinction is very important between Scandinavia um, and the Nordics in terms of who kind of gets to set the sort of hegemony of the region in terms of who has been at the locus of, of power and economic power. Um, and, and, you know, Finland as, as one of the countries. And sometimes we talk about it in, when we talk about Scandinavia versus the Nordics, we talk about um, those who have become independent from, right, those who celebrate Independence Days. And today happens to be Finland's Independence Day. Um, most recently, not from Sweden, but from Russia. It's a long history. But yeah, but that, but that, that trouble, right, of the, of the kind of borderlands there um, um, is something that definitely has attuned me in a particular way to thinking not only about the Nordics or Scandinavia as a whole, but also thinking about relations between um, the Scandinavian and Nordic countries. So I appreciate that question. Maybe just a little add-on. So on my Afro-diasporic side, I'm African-American. And you? And I'm Ethiopian and part of the generation, um, the first generation born in Finland um, and sort of broadly in the Nordics, the generation coming after the, um, the sort of first um, influx of, of refugees from the Horn of Africa, which is something that has really structured how we think about blackness in the context. So... Yeah, that matters as well. Thank you for that, Elizabeth. That definitely matters because part of what I believe in is decentering the US broadly and decentering Black American essentialism more specifically. And what we don't realize um, in a lot of conversations is that when we say Black people, we almost always assume we're talking about Americans. And we also all, always assume that that identity is universal if you identify or are identified as Black in a different context. And through living in Europe, in some cases, my American passport trumped my identity. And in other cases, my Blackness trumped my identity. But they were both identities that held different types of relationships to the environment and different power dynamics. So as we move into this conversation, really framing some of these SDGs, I want to start with the idea of SDG number five, gender equality, and number 10, reduced inequalities. We often hear about countries in Scandinavia, such as Finland, having uh, gender parity in the employment sector. And so I wonder if you all can talk a little bit about equality as it pertains to um, the Nordic context and how some of these ideals about the Nordic region as being progressive and innocent and almost um, ideal uh, as part of this conversation when we think about development goals. Whoever wants to start. Okay, so I am happy to start. So the reason we are talking about two of the SDGs at the same time is because we both as black feminists um, come from um, a training in which we can actually not separate these things. We cannot separate racial inequality from gender inequality. Uh, we are never only one thing at the time. And so these are just two factors, but there are many factors that we always treat as in entangled and interlaced. Um, and so when we talk about these myths and ideas about gender equality in the Nordics, questions that come to my mind is, oh, which women have already obtained equality or which women are doing well on the job market? And that's something that's important to, uh, to mention because obviously the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries are majority white. However, there are a pretty significant um, population of black and brown people now, but we cannot really measure how how much uh, of the population that actually is. So when we talk about gender equality, we cannot really track who's doing well and why and who is not doing well and why and what other factors might play into that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that even just the notion, right, of reducing inequality, kind of starting there and always having to work against this 
idea that the, the Nordics have it all figured out, right? They have the least inequality. They are the most progressive. They are the greenest. They are the most LGBTQ friendly. The list goes on and on and on. And I think it really matters that when we have these conversations, that's always the sort of roadblock that we first have to have to work against and tear it down to even be able to start to have the conversation of, okay, what does actually inequality look like here? Um, that is a massive barrier that, that um, gets in the way of social movements and communities trying to advocate um, uh, around issues they experience, and it also gets in the way of research, right? And as you mentioned, right, because we don't have data, um, because we are so committed to the idea that, you know, if we don't talk about race, um, we will not perpetuate racism, or that talking about race necessarily perpetuates racism. It also means that, you know, it's a great cover, right? Because that also means we can't collect um, data generally. And yet, you know, whatever limited data we do have and the limited work that has been done consistently points to very real inequalities um, in the Nordic context, right? Finland, you know, when it comes to usually international studies that are, you know, limited uh, as they're based usually in survey research. But Finland regularly tops the lists as like the most racist countries in Europe. They, they love these sensational kind of framings, right, of these reports. But but that's still a reality that, you know, 60% of, of people of African descent in Finland report experiencing discrimination in virtually every single aspect of life. Um, and other research has shown this is particularly stark in education and in the labor market. You know, Sweden is um, one of the most segregated countries in Europe and uh, the country where inequality, economic inequality is growing the fastest and not just in Europe, but among all OECD countries. Um, this should be extremely alarming. Um, and it's, you know, it's not a coincidence that it's also the most racially diverse country among, among the Nordics. Um, and just, you know, you mentioned the labor market. And again, we can't even get at this kind of intersectional analysis to think about how this impacts women. But the most rigorous studies examining anti-blackness on the Swedish labor market um, found not only that there are stark inequalities between not only black and white people in Sweden, but comparing the experiences of, of um, Afro-Swedes to all other people living in Sweden, found that, you know, of course, the labor market is both horizontally and vertically segregated, that there is a racialized class ceiling, and that inequality only grows with levels of education. And I think most damningly show that the inequality is um, starker for the second generation than it is for the first. So while we tend to talk about inequalities as as a result of migration and integration and people having poor language skills and however else we tend to frame it, the research shows us that those who are born, black people born in Sweden and presumably across the Nordics, fare worse than their parents who migrated. So we really need to think about not just integration, um, but what is the racialized structure of society that people are integrated into? Yeah, thank you for that because that leaves so the thing is that we're actually we're not responding to these questions because we cannot accept the premises, right? The separation of race and gender. And so what my work uh what I look at in my work is really okay, what is actually going on? How is racism functioning in outside of the explicit term race. So what categories are used instead and also just how are oppression uh, operationalized and how is it expressed and especially how is it felt and how is it internalized um, when we don't use the same vocabulary for race and racism as in English, for example, as in the U.S. So some of the, when, when, you, when you say, okay, so there are some reports on how um, African descendants and kids of immigrants are doing, that's something that expresses what what can be measured, which is immigration status and also being a descendant of immigrants. And so in Denmark specifically, um, Denmark has invented or rather like reinvented these two categories of Western and non-Western, which sounds so 
colonial and old school that is almost a joke, but these are very serious categories. And so immigrants to Denmark are categorized as either Western or non-Western. And when you are categorized as, as non-Western, your children are uh, categorized as descendants of non-Westerns and basically can never become Danish. And so you have several generations who are born and raised in Denmark and who can risk being sent home to a place they haven't been to and don't speak the language, right? So, so those are some of the categories. And then again, just immigrants as such, that is what is tracked, not racial identity. So that means that someone as myself, my entire life, what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, cannot be tracked and tied to my experience, my racialized experiences, because that is not, that is not a measurable, legally measurable factor, right? So that's the only thing that, um, the, the only vocabulary that can construct this idea of like us, the regular Danes, and the others, oh, the immigrants. So there's a huge gray area in between where we live as citizens, as first language speakers, as completely cultural, cultural insiders. However, with very specific experiences that we are not allowed to talk about um, legally or culturally. So, um, so the language of immigration, the discourse of immigration, the uh, and, and integration issues, that's that's that becomes a placeholder for racism. Actually, so there's a huge confusion of terms uh, between immigration, integration, ethnic discrimination. Racism, xenophobia, all of these different terms are actually pretty much used in one big pile and not um, not defined. And so when when reports come out about, oh, so actually there is racism in the Nordic countries too, as they're finding out sort of today. Um, they, they, their conclusion is, oh, there's racism in Denmark. However, they never utilize race as an analytical category. So I am just left with the question of, then what are you measuring? Ethnic or ethnicity, that's the category that's most often a placeholder for racial experiences. But it's not about ethnicity, is what I argue. As a social scientist, ethnicity means something very specific, right? It means that our good friend knows that she's, she's also an African descendant and she's Fulani. Like, people know their actual ethnic groups. That's not how they are discriminated against. Because Nordic people, European people generally, do not even have that literacy to tell ethnicity apart. So what, so what is it actually that is happening? It is racism and for African descendants, it's anti-blackness specifically. Um, so those are those are some of the things. I mean, that's that's what our work deals with, and that we have to deal with um, and sort of invent the methods because we can't draw on national statistic. We can't draw on a lot of already produced. Um, s s official data to to say anything mm -hmm. because our category is not recognized and just to follow up on that i mean this is right this is something that we talk about all the time but it 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 works in kind of this conflation right happens in different in like several different directions right on the one hand side it of course normalizes and cements this kind of hypo descent, right, around non-European or in Swedish it's utomeuropeisk, right, outside of European uh, migration. And like you said, we become first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation, right, and that that kind of that tracks you, right. But then what happens to folks who are who migrate from from the global north, right, and are black? And so there's a, a massive who are black, for example, right? So there's a massive under kind of counting, right? And that also means that whatever data we do have, whatever reports we do have, right, are underestimations uh, of the populations and, and we can presume, right, like are really gonna miss important stuff. On the other hand side, it, the, the insistence on always talking about migration when it is convenient, right, also conflates all migrants, all immigrants, right? And the majority of, 
of, of immigrants in a lot of instances are still people moving within Europe or within the Nordic countries. Um, and so when it comes to, again, you know, kind of quantitative data, that's going to um, skew a lot of what we see and know as, as a sort of supposedly um, migrant or immigrant experience. And on the flip side of that, right, we also talk often about this kind of what I like to call umbrella racism, right? Like because we just talk about migrants or non-European um, migrants, it, we talk about racism as this very broad thing. And of course, it's important to get at whiteness, for example, um, and, and thinking about, you know, the West and, and the rest. But it also obscures sometimes the very particular forms of racisms that differently racialized groups and differently positioned groups experience. And so, for example, in trying to engage with anti-blackness, this is something that scholars and activists always kind of deal with to try to push even against some of what we think we know about how racism functions or what inequality looks like more broadly to say, and we need to talk about anti-blackness specifically, and we need to talk about anti-Muslim racism specifically, and anti-Roma racism specifically, right? Differently racialized populations have different experiences of racism and are differently positioned in society. So there's so much to how the way we insist on talking about it and 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 resist talking about it that that really changes the conditions for even being able to have these conversations and therefore for us to even be able to actually measure or identify what inequality looks like. So it seems like the major intervention here in the SDGs is essentially nuance. And it's not just about measuring inequality, it's whose livelihoods are actually measured, whose lived experiences are actually measured when we're looking at these broad categories of equality or inequality or access to jobs, access to wages, for example. And one of the idealized um, views of the Nordic countries particularly is that there is a more gentle capitalism that there is a sort of sustainable capitalism that is possible and that if it is happening, it is happening in the Nordic countries um, and that this capitalism is somehow more effective and less harmful than the capitalism that we may be experiencing in the US, although we know that capitalism more broadly was born out of colonialism and plantation slavery, of which all of European countries benefited from and the literal infrastructure of most of the capitals of Europe are from the extraction of carbon and other resources from Africa, the Americas, and plantation slavery. When we think about Copenhagen as a fashion capital, Paris as a fashion capital, without the mass cultivation of cotton on plantations across the the Americas, Europe would not have been able to overtake the global textile industry. So literally the industries of Europe come from this line, this legacy of colonization, and largely the Nordic countries are divorced from those histories. And normally when you talk about colonialism, you're not talking about Denmark, you're not talking about Sweden, you're talking about the UK, you're talking about France, in some cases you're talking about Germany. But we know that the legacy of colonialism and industrialization allowed Europe to have sort of the strong economy that it has and make some social welfare policies because of this idea of a national homogenous demographic. So can you all talk about um, number 12, which is uh, reduced consumption, and number 15, life on land, and how that relates to the history of the Nordics, how we're defining capitalism, and whether there is a such thing as sustainable capitalism? No. Yes, we can. <laughs> Thank you. That's it. Okay, that was a lot. Thank you, Teju. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll just start somewhere, just for those who don't know, to just situate Denmark within its colonial history, which it is not as a nation uh, promoting, right? So Greenland is arguably still, I mean, Greenland is not sovereign. Let me tell you that. People born there have Danish citizenship. You conclude what it is. Um, so there is that. And then the um, Danish participation in the, in the transatlantic slave trade was the, what is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. 
and they sold those islands to the U.S., including human beings, um, a little over 100 years ago. And so, so there is this both geographical distance, but also a distance in time that's made it very, very easy and very convenient for um, to sort of just write that chapter out of Danish history altogether. Meanwhile, those of you who know Copenhagen know how cute it is, how pretty it is. You probably know Christianshavn, which is used in like all tourism, uh, tourist brochures and so on. These colored little houses on the board, border of the, of the channel. Um, what few of you know is that in one of those little door, doorways, there's actually a little, a little figurine of like a, a sugar refiner. Uh, and on the other side of the wa water is this big building, which is an old sugar refinery. They still left the name on it, actually. And so that whole harbor area was um, very much built for, for this whole import, right? So just to talk about sugar money, obviously, in uh, addition to cotton, maybe you will talk about iron later. So narratives are very important what stories nations tell about themselves and the nordics have uh definitely told uh, told themselves and you all a story about themselves as uh not only european and therefore sort of the bearer of human rights and the ones who are going to teach human rights and democracy to the rest of the world but just slightly more european and innocent than the rest right like not just white but like super white and, and that really matters because it means that when, when history then resurfaced, such as in 2017, when there was a commemoration of the sale of these islands to the U.S., that was the first time a lot of people even heard about this, right? But the thing is that the structures and the global relationships very much um, are still there, right? So that's why it matters to talk about colonial histories because, well... Is it really history or is it just a continuation of the, the global structures that we still live within? And so that connects to, I mean, the, the, this notion of Nordic ex exceptionalism, right? That, oh, the Nordic countries are different than the rest of the European countries. We can sort of recognize that England and France, for example, were super big empires, but the, the Nordic country, the Scandinavian countries' participation in that has very conveniently just been uh, minimized. So one way that affects us today is this raceless self-perception that, well, we can't talk about race with regards to discrimination and sort of like Scandinavians like us, but also Scandinavian people largely don't know that they're white. That's a very, very big obstacle to even starting any kind of con uh, conversations. And, and, um, and the defensiveness, both to this idea of like, hey, you're white, but also, hey, you're not innocent. That is huge, right? And so, also, just I mean, when I when I when we mentioned before some of the practical um, parts about we cannot collect racial data, that means obviously also we cannot study these things, right? So in the university, there's no such thing as black studies or ethnic studies or whatever, which then also means there actually are nobody trained in racial analysis, full stop. So the people publishing these, uh, these, these reports, I, because I'm a researcher and a nerd and a stalker, and I'm just on these websites, and I'm like, what are people's, what are people's uh, training? What are people's training? It is, not, it is not this. It is not this. So that is very, very troubling. So every time there are new reports come out, just as, just a few uh, weeks ago, the Danish Institute for Human Rights published a report being like, oh my God, there's discrimination in Denmark. And, um, and I'm like, yeah. And also, <laughs> I mean, wh what, what kind of discrimination? What is it that you're measuring? But also, who are you, the researchers? What is your positionality? What's your part in it? What is your role in, in a racist society? Plus, also, what is your training or lack of training, right? So, so that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the landscape of knowledge production and sort of critical self-reflection as it is right now. And also, the reason the both of us are not there and, and are doing, have, have done our PhDs here because we actually have had, have had access to this word we needed, right? Race. <laughs> 
Yeah. And that really, um, gets at what I think a lot about in terms of how, you know, Nordic exceptionalism, the, the kind of other side of that, or the, the thing that they often need as, as, as an accompaniment to Nordic exceptionalism is a reliance on U.S. exceptionalism to say, well, no, these are American problems. These don't exist here, right? Um, and that, that, that both goes with how they talk about history, right? The history of colonialism, history of slavery, um, you know, settler colonialism. It goes with how they talk about histories of, of discrimination and segregation, right? Um, but also then when it comes to the question of how we talk about race, right? They say, well, don't import don't import this American language, this American analysis that doesn't fit here, right? Uh, and that's kind of what you get accused of doing. And I think, you know, black people in general, anytime <laughs> anybody tries to talk about any of this stuff always gets accused of, like, importing that. And whether it's academics getting, you, you know, accused of importing um, this kind of racial analysis or it's everyday people who are accused of, like, just wanting to use hip hop culture. I don't even know. Like people use all kinds of arguments, right? But it, there's always this kind of like U.S. cultural corruption that is leading us to want to talk about race. And if we just actually were kind of rooted in the local context, we would see that it's really just about class or or integration or um, you know fill in the blank. Um, so the way that Nordic exceptionalism and U.S. exceptionalism kind of together get wielded to really shut down conversations, to obscure um, the structural conditions and material realities is is something that is, you know, endlessly fascinating to me. And I think, again, uh, presents like an obstacle that we kind of have to cut through. But to go back uh, a little bit to where we started, um, in terms of thinking about you know, I appreciate, Elizabeth, you um, situating this within, you know, the history of colonialism. Like, that's important if we're going to talk about Nordic capitalism. Um, and, you know, especially when they refer to other European countries as these bigger empires, um, certainly true that they had these larger scales. But, you know, just because they failed at fulfilling their colonial dreams... Um, to the extent that some of these other powers did doesn't mean that the impulse wasn't there, right? Or that the logic wasn't there, that the cultural foundation um, wasn't there, right? And yet when we talk about its legacies, they say, again, oh, the N-word doesn't mean the same thing here as it did over there. You know, like these cultural legacies are not the same here um, because, you know, they'd have no history here, uh, but they in fact do, right? And in the Swedish case, right, um, also participated in the slave trade, right? Built um, a slave fort on what is today Cape Coast of Ghana. And um, their longest standing colony uh, was the island of St. Barthélemy. Um, but they also, you know, failed at establishing a settler colony in, in the United States. Um, what is today the United States, right? And it's not just that they participated in this, right? But that this is, of course, part of, you know, when, I mean, Europe is being built, right? The economic foundations are being built. Um, nation, state, nation states are, are developing. And, um, and so, you know, there's, there's the history of, of law, right? And, and like you said, that distancing is very important. In my work in thinking about criminalization, it's very interesting when, when you know, in Sweden you can say, well, we don't have a history of sort of um, r racialized kind of legal discrimination or different different um, rights under the law. But I mean, you did in your colony, you had black codes. They, was that not administered by the Swedish courts, right? Was that not part of the purview of the Swedish um, kingdom? Um, but because of that distance, you can say, well, it wasn't part of, of us proper, right? Or our legal system. And there are lots of other ways to, to poke and prod at that. Um, but also these economic underpinnings, right? You talked about sugar and cotton, and one of the things that um, I always think about with Sweden is the question of, of iron. Um, they are, to this day, the, the, the biggest iron ore producers of Europe um, and have, I think, like 90% of the, the iron ore mines in, in Europe. And they became really... They've been involved in... in, in um, the manufacturing of steel and, and um, for for a very long time, but became very uh, important players in the transatlantic slave trade because of their iron ore production. And in fact, that was one of the ways that they were able to continue to economically benefit 
um, from slavery even after the transatlantic trade was banned, um, uh, in part because of how they could supply colonial powers and slave traders with with iron. Right, so that that. You know, historians refer to that as the sort of Swedish um, slave iron. But when you talk about the history of iron, this is kind of erased. And another part of that is that the iron um, iron ore comes from mines that are on indigenous lands. Another part of the equation that we never talk about uh, in the case of um, Finland, Sweden, and Norway is that they are also settler colonies um, and built in part on the on Sápmi, on the land of the Sami people, who to this day are fighting for access to their lands, for and to environmentally protect their lands from capitalist extractivism, um, for their right to self determination, to culture, to language, um, and so forth. And so the iron, right, that became so um, famous during the slave trade is also because extracted. What was it used for? The iron. To build ships, to build shackles, to build tools uh, used on plantations, right? Like you can't build ships. You can't build these ships that can cross the Atlantic uh, without this iron. And that iron is extracted from mines on indigenous lands. And this battle is is ongoing. This is not just historical. Just these past few months, Sami activists have been doing sit-ins in Norway and protesting um, across um, Finland, Sweden, and Norway um, around the, around these issues. Um, so these things are tied, right? Settler, their settler colonial kind of project is tied to their colonial and imperial projects. And it's tied to the the economic backbones um, of, of these countries, as it is for for all of Europe, right? But there are these specificities that I think it's also important to pay attention to in the Nordic context. So when we talk about sustainability and environmentalism, right, um, we have to ask sustainability for whom and at the expense of whom, and also kind of to go back to another another part of this that kind of connects back to, you know, how we talk about um, migrants and and refugees is that sometimes there is this really twisted um, liberal argument for why the Nordic countries should be open to non-European uh, migration. And that is because, well, after all, we need to sustain our society because people in the Nordics are not having enough children and because people have been able to transcend the working class, we need a labor force. We need people who are going to be cleaners. We need people who are going to take care of our elders, who are going to do the undesirable work in our society. And so there's a weird way in which sustainability kind of gets co-opted, right, to argue for um, a weird kind of inclusion on the premise of exploitation. Um, and, you know, this not only concerns how the Nordic societies and Nordic countries are organized within but also in terms of what they export, in terms of their foreign policy, in terms of business practices in the global south, right? Um, there's a whole other conversation that can be had about neo-colonial kind of business and, and foreign policy practices. So again, sustainability for whom, um, welfare for whom, and at the expense of whom. Thank you for that. And I think what's really clear to me about the Nordic region is how all of these contradictions can exist at once because of the narrative of the Nordics. For example, the very strong, robust welfare state of Norway is due to them discovering oil in the 1950s. And so they're able to have this robust economy because they extract mass amounts of oil and they are currently trying to extend their territory to the Arctic so that they could frack to get more oil. And they are also seen as an environmentally sustainable country. And yet the basis of their welfare system comes from the extraction of oil and relationships with places like Nigeria, where oil extraction is literally tied to colonial relationships. And so there's these um, tensions that Elizabeth and Jasmine, you are both sort of debunking and extracting in this context about exceptionalism um, and how that relates to exceptionalism in the US. For example, when I was doing my master's in Brussels, I used some data from the city of Brussels to map the neighborhoods where mostly African descendants live and other people in Brussels. And what my map showed was that people of African descent lived uh, in places with less access to green space.
space. I showed this map to my professors who helped me create it. And they said, oh, well, we don't have spatial segregation like in the US. And I said, well, here's this map that I made using the data that you all collect from the city of Brussels. And then they said, well, there's not that many people of African descent anyways, so it's kind of irrelevant. So even though I used the information that they did collect to create this map that showed that there's a separation of black people from green spaces in Brussels or people who would be considered black, I was still told that this is an American concept that I'm importing onto the map of Brussels, right? And there's all of this colonial infrastructure and architecture that's there that proves that this is not something that has been imported that is actually homegrown. So as we near the end of this conversation, um, we want to ask you all, what can people do now that they have this expanded information about the myth of Nordic utopia, um, these contradictions about capitalism, sustainability, inequality, what are some takeaways and actions that you encourage folks to do with this information and knowledge that you have shared? So since we are here at a university and we're talking about the myth, right? Um, we talked about this and like, you cannot go fix our countries. We, we can do that or we're trying to, but Let's really talk about this myth, right? And the investment in, in wanting to think that the Nordics is so great and like upholding that, recirculating that. So what I wanna say um, is read us in a, in, a broad, in a broad sense, right? Read black and brown Scandinavians. Right? And believe us. And remember that we're experts too. We are not only talking about um, racism, we actually are <laughs> highly, often overeducated, and we're experts, right? So expand your syllabi, expand your entertainment, uh, look at who's producing what, right? So I know, for example, the. Um, the, the Danish film um, sector is also extremely whitewashed, right? So, like, find small, small producers, like, independent media, like, go, go consume different things than, than what is uh, mainstream from these, from these places. Uh, because we exist and, and we speak. So you just got to find it. I mean, everything Elizabeth just said. Um, but I think also, you know, what Teju was leaving us with in terms of, again, these erasures and these myths, I just want to kind of highlight yet again that, you know, it's not thinking about race and racism in this context is, is not new. Um, it's sometimes presented as I, I had a, a somebody to, a professor tell me, oh, these are just the growing pains of a newly diversifying society, right? The idea that that diversity and, and people of color just kind of plopped in in 1990 um, and didn't exist before that or that, that racism didn't exist before that, right, is something that we have to push back against. And it's not just that this is developing because, or that, that racism exists because racialized people are there. But let's not forget that Europe, right, invented race and racism, um, and that the the Nordic countries and Sweden in particular had a very important role in developing the the, the so-called racial sciences and eugenics that, in fact, informed U.S. Jim Crow policy that informed Nazi Germany. Right, that this is actually um, where a lot of this work has has been done. And and to when we think about the Nordic welfare states to also um, remember that these were also racialized and as scholars have shown eugenicist projects explicitly sometimes in their fashioning. And so yes, read, read us, but also don't perpetuate the myth, right? Think critically uh, about what you hear. When, when you hear things circulating about um, the Nordic countries being the best at this or the least bad at that, you know, ask for whom, um, ask based on what, um, interrogate these histories and, and question them. Um, 
And, you know, I think this is especially important because it's not just in academic context, right? Like this, this, this myth, this conception travels, travels really widely and is used by, for example, U.S. politicians are talking about, you know, well, we need to just reform the U.S. Um, criminal legal system to look more Scandinavian and we'll get rid of all its issues, right? And that should be really concerning, um, the way that we kind of set up, um, set up, set up this this comparison, and the way that it's imported and, and utilized in particular ways. So, of course, it's going to impact. It impact like every time that this stuff gets perpetuated, it impacts the struggles um, that communities of color are are facing and waging in in the Nordic context because it just adds fuel to kind of the 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 dismissing uh, of what people experience. But it also should be concerning to people in the U.S. Um, how how the sort of construction of just the importation of of Nordic solutions is just going to do away with racism and inequality. So yeah, you know, question, question, question. Think critically, and when in doubt, read our work. <laughs> when when it looks too good to be true, it probably it is. is. Um, so we're going to take some questions that students submitted earlier, um, and then I guess we will open it up to audience questions. So the first question is, how is awareness of structural racism acknowledged publicly in the Nordic countries, if at all? Um, Elizabeth, you talked about this a little bit with the 100-year uh, anniversary of Denmark selling the Virgin Islands to the U.S. for $25 million. Um, and I wonder, uh, Elizabeth, um, Jasmine, if you could talk a little bit about your work with criminalization. Um, I'm thinking about the Black Lives Matter movement resurgence uh, in 2016, 17, 18, and what was happening in places like Paris and London, where they were talking about um, primarily African, North and West African men being uh, killed in police custody. So if you guys can both talk about that sort of public conception of racism in those contexts? Um, in terms of, yeah, it's very interesting because if we're specifically talking about structural racism, right, I think what we're kind of getting at is that that's where the analysis is really lacking. Um, so much of the research and the public conversation around racism, even when, you know, in the few instances that we want to engage with it, the preference is, of course, to keep it as an interpersonal psychological phenomenon, right? We'll talk, if we talk about it, we'll talk about Nazis, We'll talk about skinheads. We'll talk about racial violence. Um, these are the stories that people want to hear because, yeah, the, well, we can talk about what, what psychologically is motivating people to really want to just, like, consume um, racial violence and racial pain, right, and all these narratives. But that's kind of where we stay so often. We don't really talk about structure. And even when there is an impulse to do so, I think it was really interesting, uh, especially after the uprisings of 2020, that there were all these institutions that kind of were like, all right, we need to talk about structural racism, but they don't understand what it is or, or how to go about it, right? Like I was, I, I was asked to, you know, to come in and do research on structural racism by interviewing people. And I was like, well, that, it, it's more complex than that. It's not, you know, you, we want to kind of use the sort of same old, um, methods for thinking about racism as something that's just experiential and, and we don't really have the tools to think about the structural. So that's, that's one thing there. And then of course, there's just the, the, um, unwillingness, right. To see it as, as you mentioned, Teju, with your experience in, in Brussels, like when it comes to the question of policing and criminalization, this certainly is the case that even when we can, we can show evidence Right. Even when we can say, here's what's happening, here's what people are experiencing, here are the videos, right? So often we have to have, again, this like painful, violent evidence um, just to get people to believe that something is real. The response becomes, oh, that's horrible. But it's, it's you know, some police officers are just, 
not great, or private security guards, which, you know, private security forces are increasingly kind of relied upon in, in the policing of the Swedish urban landscape. Well, the problem is that they're just not trained as well as the real police officers, right? It becomes all this stuff. When we talk about hyper-policing and racial profiling in, in the racialized urban periphery in these extremely segregated communities, police officers will tell me, well, it's about place. It's not about race. It's just this neighborhood has issues. And so we have to police differently here than we do in the inner city. And this is all, these are all narratives that we know from, from the U.S. context as well, right? And from any other place, this kind of, there's a kind of, um, kind of mental gymnastics, right? Like there's ways to, to resolve the cognitive dissonance that always ends up in some, either some version of like, but it's not exact, it's not structural racism, it's this other kind of racism, or, you know, it's just their culture, it's just we have problems, it's, it's something else, rather than actually being able to sit with and think about like, wow, how did this become institutionalized? What does it mean to understand it as structural? Uh, what does it mean to really actually have that analysis rooted in the local context? Because they are excellent media scholars, public, you know, and public conversations were excellent at talking about structural racism in the United States. You know, people are very well read. It's not ignorance. Um, I think it's, it's, you know, it's a willful ignorance. It's a willful kind of misunderstanding um, and, and circumventing, I think, of that, that issue. So I think that's, yeah, the structural uh, piece there is, I think, extremely important. Yeah, I don't have so much to to add to that. I completely agree. And just some ways that I um, sum that up is that, so the, the way racism functions there obviously is structural and institutionalized, but the general public understanding of it is not a structural understanding. I mean, they don't understand it as a larger structure and as basically the default. But as incidents, if we talk about interpersonal, in, interpersonal relationships, it's incidents or maybe ignorance. And when we talk about larger historical, obviously uh, racist um, events, it's precisely as events, right? Something that occurred and then it stopped. So, so there's that and then the few times there actually is some sort of articulation of a perpetrator or somebody responsible that is a racist. And um, in the framework that I work with, there's no such thing as a racist. Um, but that's a way to create a norm that is innocent. And then the few deviants who are psychologically wrong or off or, or, or simply just undereducated or something, right? So it's a way to sort of extract the few rotten apples from the default, from the nation, from the, um, yeah, from, from the Scandinavian nation and folk as, as basically and like foundationally good and innocent. And so, yeah, so Gloria Becker, who is from um, the Netherlands, well, from Suriname, she, she wrote a book called White Innocence, and that notion resonates a lot um, with these countries who have, just, just like the Netherlands, very much like this like over-European self-perception, just like slightly better than the rest. I'll just add to that that it's wild how even, in, even today when Finland, Sweden, Denmark, right, like particular like Sweden and um, Finland right now have completely normalized the explicitly racist ethno-nationalist far right, like they run right governments. So even these people who we defined as this kind of fringe um, are normalized to the point that, you know, obviously they have popular support and and they rule. And this has been the case for a long time in, in Denmark and Sweden and Finland. Um, we still somehow talk about their racism as individual, psychological, like attitudinal, like we still are incapable. Like, well, in Finland last summer, there were massive protests because it had come out that several people um, with high ranking minister positions in the Finnish parliament were like, you know, affiliated with Nazis or like, 
had said, you know, had spewed kind of very race, explicitly racist, kind of advocating for racial violence stuff on the internet. And people rallied in the thousands against this, but their policies, right? <laughs> or like their vision of society that is still fundamentally um, racist and oppressive, that gets less attention. Right, so even when you know we kind of start to shatter some image of of the kind of social progressive, um, social democracy, even then we're incapable of actually grappling with like racism as structural, and we still want to talk about you know the comments that this politician made rather than the policies that they're proposing. This reminds me um, of Dianke Hondias, who is another scholar from the Netherlands, and she says there's this repetition of surprise for four centuries in Europe at uh, the idea of Black people being there and racism, that every time it comes up, people are surprised that it exists um, as kind of this willful ignorance, as you said. So another question from a student is, is finding a sense of community in such a hegemonic country difficult? How have you retained your cultural roots? Um, Elizabeth, maybe we can start with you because I know a lot of your dissertation was about belonging. Yeah, thank you. Um, that is that is my entire big question <laughs> for my whole dissertation. Um, yeah, where do I begin? So, yes, it's very difficult. It's very difficult. I mean, I'm not there. I haven't been there for 10 years. So let's start there. The denial of race as an idea and as a real social factor that structure how we are together, that's also something that we internalize, especially those of us growing up in white families. Um... So you learn to say, oh, I'm just Danish. And then you learn to avoid people who look like you because you might be reminded of who you are and you don't want that because you really want to just socially survive and blend in like kids do, right? And so those patterns for a lot of people um, separating themselves from themselves continue, 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 continue. And so... The research that I did, um, I spoke with a lot of people who were, I mean, up until in their, I think somebody was in their 60s, but a lot of people in their 30s and 40s, many of them had not had a conversation about their actually, their, how they're doing, how they're doing as black Danish people in their life at all, right? It was the first time they spoke with me, a stranger, technically, um, they had a lot of aha moments in conversation with me for like an hour and a half. And they had lived, you know, they're in the middle of their adult life and basically never said a lot of these things out loud that they'd definitely been, been feeling and experiencing. But you learn to gaslight yourself because every time you say, hey, I had a bad experience, I think it's because I'm black you will only get resistance because remember, racism doesn't exist, right? And so you also, you learn to do that to each other too. Oh, that bothers you? That doesn't bother me at all. They can totally touch my hair, I don't care. That kind of thing um, where we minimize and, and yeah, and invalidate the experiences of each other, right? Because, so I have a lot of um, sympathy and, um, warmth for an understanding for these types of behaviors because it's survival. And so what, I mean, my, my dissertation is called Black Racial Isolation because the pattern of the first generations of Black Danish people, the pattern has been that everyone has been navigating that existence and that experience alone because the first generations of Danes were um, systematically either in interracial families and or adopted um, or these like random people from some colonies but who did not come with an entire family and not even like a community like for example in England right so they have different experiences here it's been very much just like you are the one and so a lot of people it's not 
it's not until now in some of the uh, um, the Black Lives Matter movements in Denmark in 2016 and then in 20, 2020 that a lot of people were in spaces where they were not the only one. So yeah, it is very, very difficult and so difficult that a lot of people are just completely discouraged and kind of have given up because then what also has happened as a way of creating solidarity is trauma bonding. And a lot of people don't want to just be identified with their trauma. So they're like, okay, if, if this is blackness, then I'm not black. And then they stay out of um, trying to find community or hopping into the political online communities that people have been building, building because there's been so much uh, focus on just like racial discrimination and just as so so it becomes this negation instead of the full and whole and beautiful experience and and especially the connection to somewhere instead of always being asked where you're from and always being removed from the place that you call home actually situating yourself within a larger diaspora globally, but also just in Denmark, um, knowing that you are not alone with your experience, that's a privilege. So many people don't know that yet. And I think that's a premise for um, for reaching out to others in a healthy way, uh, is that you, you got you to gotta take that leap and admit your blackness or your brownness, whatever you call yourself, um, but you have to shake off the, the racelessness. Yeah, and I think that another thing that I think is really interesting is the way that um, that that you know place and and time and like geography really matters. Like it's, I see differences across the Nordic countries, and I think we need to sometimes remember that as well. That there are still slightly different histories, um, of course, between the Nordic countries and and growing up kind of between Finland and Sweden, always seeing that difference and the different potential for that uh, between the two countries as well. Finland being much smaller, the black community being much smaller, um, and Sweden always being, and Stockholm in particular, always being this place where we were like, when we go to Stockholm, like we can see ourselves reflected in our surroundings. And when we're in Helsinki in Finland, we couldn't see that. Um, and so, so, so the differences between countries, but also then, you know, class and, and generation, right? What Elizabeth is describing as the kind of first generation, right, of people who are a lot more isolated, that experience looks a little bit different for the generation that grew up in the, the immigrant working class urban peripheries, right, and, and um, the late 80s and early 90s, where we were all placed in the same place, right? And so our, we actually did see each other and ourselves reflected um, in the communities around us. And again, that looks different depending on what city you happen to grow up in. Um, and again, class class mattered for where you ended up. But in Sweden, for example, I mean, you can come from a community where I, you know, I talk to people who are like, I never experienced racism until I was a teenager and I started going into the city, into the inner city for the first time. And I started going to high school and I actually moved beyond the boundaries of these communities where segregation, right, um, actually was protective and nurtured um, community and identity. And of course, there are complications to that in terms of whether that togetherness is, is, is blackness, whether it's trauma bonding, whether it's uh, a shared migrant experience or a shared experience of racialization and so forth. But there are differences in these experiences as well that I think um, is important to think about. And so there are different conditions, right, for creating belonging and creating identification. And there's also a way in which, um, you know, in Sweden, for example, kind of structurally, institutionally, right, like kind of ethnic-based associations were always very encouraged. You should organize on the basis of your, your homeland. Um, and so these were the organizational forms that, were, that received funding and you know, um, some activists I talked to say, well, of course, they are hoping we're all going to go back to where we came from one day. So we got to maintain our language skills and our cultural ties. But this structured, so because, you know, the other part of the question was this question of, you know, how you maintain your culture and your roots. And these are different questions, I think. There are ways that people maintain their culture and, and their roots. Um, and then, but I think kind of the shift towards belonging became with this sort of shared identification across culture. And it was about the shared experience, um, whether that was 
a, sh a reflection on shared experiences of anti-blackness or racism, but also shared experiences of like being diasporans and, and relationships to the diaspora, whether in the Americas or, or the continent. Um, and yeah, so I guess just to sum up, like there's a lot of isolation, but then there are these pockets um, of, of, I think, belonging um, and of, um, of shared identity that is increasingly developed. And, and it's not a simple one, right? It's not like there's a cohesive sense, even if we might use terms like Afro-Swedish or African-Norwegian, there's no consensus kind of around what these terms mean. Um, but there is a grappling with it collectively, and there's a thinking about, you know, what we share and what we owe each other and what we want to build for ourselves and for each other. And again, even doing that work has different kinds of conditions and opportunities um, in across the Nordic context. Um, and even that work, right, of building something for ourselves, even just within ourselves, is also constrained by the way that we talk about race in the Nordics or don't talk about race in the Nordics. And so at the interest of time, I'll ask one more question. Oh, so should I not do that? <laughs> I'm going to look to Persis. Uh, they... I think we're going to open it up to audience questions. Does that work, Teju, if we open up to audience questions and I'll, I'll run the mic around? All right, thank you so much. Uh, please. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Carmela Wilkins. Uh, I'm coming from the Department of, um, well, the School of College of Engineering and um, the College of Environmental Design. I'm a designer specifically focusing on like food systems design when it comes to food apartheid and black geographies. And my question is, um, so I've been intrigued by the consistent high rankings of Nordic countries in the Global Happiness Index. Um, particularly with like Finland taking um, num number one for the past like six years. And then as far as the top 10, I'm pretty sure all, if not most, um, Scandinavian and like Nordic countries are in the top 10 for this index. I'd love to hear your thoughts on um, how these happiness metrics might reflect or contrast with the themes we've discussed in the context of like global social, economic, and political contexts. This seems like a good opportunity for Elizabeth to talk about Higge. <laughs> well, I mean, that, thank you for your question. That's, um, yeah, that's something that I think about a lot, that that's how these countries are promoted and they've sort of internally competed uh, to have that happiest country in the world title. And um, so, sure, there are some things about the Danish uh, or, well, the Scandinavian welfare models that does give you um, some conditions for a pretty good life if you are inside, you know, if you get in, let into the club. So if you get your citizenship or whatever you need, and that is so, so hard. And so those, that index just reflects to me that... Um, whoever has responded on a survey or however they figure out that these countries are the happiest in the world are privileged people. Um, and so again, it's this like reflection of going to, I don't know, let's, let's imagine like a, um, a survey like in the street, right? Like stopping all of these white looking people, asking them how they're doing, how their life is, whatever, how many hours of hobby leisure they have a week, but not asking Shasmin and I because we are categorized as foreigners. And so what would we know about our countries, right? So I just straight up don't trust those indexes. I mean, I just, I just know they're not true. And also, I mean, if you're interested in in segregation and I don't know if you know anything about the Nordics, but maybe you have heard of the ghetto law in Denmark, which is a very big project of um, sort of force integrating people stigmatized as non-Westerns and the areas where these people have lived in where they were more than 50%. All of those areas have formally been categorized as ghettos. 
um, that doesn't sound very happy to me. And, and then there's a lot of um, actually like breaks with the constitution, like exceptions from the law, how you can punish people, how you can force people if they are so-called ghetto residents, you can um, take away rights and, and demand other civic duties that you do not demand uh, of the rest of the population. Um, so that is extremely racist, but they don't use the term race, right? It's uh, non-Western and Western, and that is supposed to be neutral, uh, just geographic de uh, describing words, words which, uh, yeah, was there not. So, um, happy, who, right? You gotta ask who, you gotta ask who. And Denmark also has a high use of antidepressants, which is very accessible because they have a great socialized healthcare system. So I think it's also about how happiness is being defined and who has access to happiness. And I think the, even something Elizabeth said, I just want to highlight because yeah, like the happiness index, right? The questions are not actually about like feelings of happiness, right? The, the it's some sort of formulation of like, do you have access to basic conditions need, needed to sustain life, right? Like, um, and so, yeah, on paper, right? Like the, the Nordic countries look like they've got a lot of this stuff figured out, but truly getting at that question of access, even people with citizenship, um, depending on where you live, how you live, what your relationship is to the state and these institutions, it, a lot of people can't actually access or spend an inordinate amount of time trying to access this this welfare that the welfare state promises. Um, and that includes education, that includes healthcare, that includes, you know, the labor market, um, that includes literally kind of the, the social safety net, the economic safety net. Um, and so, so for a lot of people, uh, even if we're not talking about, you know, happiness as, as a sort of psychological condition, but talking about this sort of security um, um, in life, you know, there are a lot of people for whom that relationship is, uh, is a lot more precarious. And of course the for whom is racialized and classed, et, et cetera. We have time for two more questions. We'll go here and then we'll conclude here. I'll make it quick. Hello y'all. Thank y'all. Y'all are amazing. Uh, my name is Coffee J. I'm a hip hop educator organizer and hip hop is such an important thing for passing ideas of revolution, identity and culture. Definitely not talking about corporate industry that's fueled by the dollars of suburban college age white people that have been celebrating black pathology and objectification for a long time. I'm talking about the culture and uh, that pops up around the world. A lot of places that need to speak out uh, for you know rights and whatnot. What does that look like there? Thank you for that question. Um, I mean, of course, hip hop is commercial there, like it is, you know, uh, everywhere. And there's a, you know, we could talk a lot about the kind of relationship, right, to the consumption of hip hop and the consumption of, of kind of black urban culture. Um, but you know, I would say hip hop and hip hop culture, and more broadly, you know, thinking about slam poetry, like thinking about all these different things um, that pertain to the kind of broader culture have been absolutely crucial in kind of building uh, empowerment and belonging in particular in um, the urban peripheries of, of Sweden, um, where this is how, how some of this collective identity building happens is through uh, people in communities um, creating spaces for, for cultural, for kind of cultural production. Um, that resonate and that mobilize youth. And I would say, you know, I don't know if this is true across the board, but certainly in Sweden, precisely because of everything we've said about, about how the discursive space is so limited, the, more, the most critical work and the most critical perspectives on what it means to be black um, in Sweden is coming from the arts, not from the academy, right? Not from people with book deals. Um, right, because it's also about gatekeeping, right, and who gets access to what institutions. And so I think that, and I think hip hop culture has been a driving force in this. You know, we also obviously, you know, as being part of the hip hop generation, like it was through hip hop that you kind of early on got to see narratives and got to see analyses um, of society as as racialized and as unequal. And and that that was true for for you know me growing up in the '90s as well. 
And so I think um, rappers and, and hip hop culture has been, has been really important in facilitating these kinds of conversations. Um, and then I think it's grown from that into other, other parts of um, the arts as well. But it's, it's absolutely been um, foundational. And again, of course, it has, since it's now lucrative, has been co-opted and uh, utilized in all kinds of ways. And there's a whole wave of, you know, um, kind of moral panic around gangster rap and wanting to criminalize um, particular forms of rap or ban particular forms of rap that are, of course, tied to young black men and, and the urban peripheries who are talking about the social realities that are created precisely by the inequalities um, of the state. So it's a fraught relationship. But I would say I, I see a lot of, um, a lot of light um, through, through that. Good morning, y'all. My name is Sakina Shabazz. I work at the UC Berkeley Food Institute under the Rouser College of Natural Resources. And I have a question about um, food ways, Afro-Nordic food ways, if y'all can speak to that. Um, can one of you, can one or both of you talk about Afro diasporic culinary traditions in Scandinavia? In the US, we have the likes of Marcus Samuelson, who's a famous chef, but a lot of his culinary practices largely reflect African American food ways, like at his restaurant Red Rooster in Harlem and in Miami and in London. He grew up in Sweden and is also Ethiopian. Are there bodega style stores or grocery chains, restaurants, culturally relevant food options in schools or things of that nature? I can imagine the presence of these institutions and cultural food practices might present a break in the cultural homogeneity of Scandinavia. What were your experiences like or does food come up in any of your work? That's a fun question I did not expect. Um, <laughs> thank you. Well, I have I have different uh, contradicting thoughts because when you sort of ask the question from here, um, the first thing I feel is that oh, maybe we weren't clear. Like we are not one like Afro Nordic people, not in our own countries, not across, not at all. And that's also why like we just always need to historicize the work that we do, and we can't just like make comparisons, right? So. There are reasons that um, in certain contexts, colonized contexts, you can talk about like, oh, the black culture. I know it's still super diverse, right? But there, there's a notion. There is no such thing because it's so just extremely diverse and relatively recent, right, compared to like black populations in the Americas. And uh, so like as I said, I'm... African American, um, Jasmine is is Ethiopian. All of these other people have all. Everybody's just very from very different places, or their parents are from different places. Um, so, so I was yeah. So different people have their little stores, maybe, and like hair salons. That's not food, but just like to, in in terms of what what stores exist, but. In Denmark, as far as I know, like a, a, a black thing, a black food store, not so much, right? It would w very much be like, oh, let's have this like Senegalese store, whatever. And then I'm sure it's also very um, just lumping a lot of things together just because then, you know, everybody who needs plantains can go there or whatever it is, right? Um, but... No, it's I don't know. People have just done the best in in my experience in Denmark. Yeah, I I appreciate that that question. Um, and I think as Elizabeth said, like yeah, it's not a very straightforward thing to think through. But I think I have a little bit of a different experience from Elizabeth. So first of all, just the the easy question about you know whether there are sort of I forget how you phrased it, but the kind of culturally relevant foods in schools and stuff like that. The best you could do is get like halal. No, you, actually, you couldn't even get halal in school. You could just have an alternative to pork. Like that's the best you could wish for, right? But like in terms of the food in schools, this is something that we all grew up like joking about was like, you know, squarely whatever, Finnish, Swedish. Um, so there's no kind of infusion of, of, of food kind of culturally from, from where the people in the neighborhood actually came from, right? Um, and in terms of um, food ways, I mean, I, I think about that a lot. And, um, and again, this, this is very different from country to country, from city to city. But 
because in, in Finland and Sweden, the majority of the African diasporic population is from the Horn of Africa, um, that ends up structuring, you know, that, that means I get to feel right at, at home in a lot of that. So it's very like Ethiopian, Eritrean, Somali. So in our neighborhoods, we have stores, right. And, 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 and restaurants. And for me, one sign that I'm home is I can walk down the street and I can smell some auntie cooking, right. Dodo what, like in, in, in the neighborhood, right. Like that being kind of just generally part of the kind of shared experience. And that is is something that people from those neighborhoods identify with and experience, right, regardless, right? Like, so we don't have fusion, but everybody grows up eating jollof rice and everybody grows up eating injera and everybody grows up eating, you know, plantains with their rice and chicken, you know, whatever it is. Like, so there's kind of these, like, the, I think the, the communities that are represented or that are, that are, that make up the majority their food cultures have become part of a shared, at least sort of in some sense, diasporic um, food sensibility. And again, th- but this is also very specific to the urban peripheries where the majority of us live um, and or where, where, where we are the majority. And this is not going to be true if you go to communities that are that are majority white, right? So there's definitely that, that kind of interesting kind of diasporic thing. Um, and it's also, you know, but also a lot of these communities, with some exceptions, we don't, it's, there are the few communities where we're like majority black, right? And even th- within that, lots of diversity. But um, I feel it's important also to say that like, even when we think about the food culture piece, these are the kind of African diasporic things, but we're also always, our neighbors and our, our, our folks in the neighborhood are also from across the the, the Middle East and North Africa, and, and those things also become part of the food culture. So this kind of, kind of, you know, hybridity in a way is part of what defines um, the shared experience. So there's nothing that's particularly salient, and at the same time, yeah, it's that's we still kind of claim that, and we know it. And when we go other, when we're in other spaces, it becomes stark. I think. Right, just, I mean, I could, yeah, Turkish, Moroccan, Pakistani stores and restaurants all over the place, for sure, right? But just, like, within the African diaspora specifically, not so much. But that's the thing. It's, that was also places that were, like, home-ish. I mean, I was taken to an Ethiopian place in Norborough when I asked where Black people, like, went, and they took me to an Ethiopian restaurant. And they were like, this is where we go and eat. And... It was not just black people. It was, as you said, Middle Eastern people, people of different African ethnicities, but that was like a central hub for where they gathered and ate food. And the Nobro neighborhood, I'm sure Elizabeth can talk about it, is one of the more diverse neighborhoods. And that actually brings up, I think, a really important point, too, about space. It's It's interesting. Sometimes in Stockholm, I've had these conversations with people like when we're in some like hipster inner city neighborhood and they're like, oh, there aren't like black owned restaurants, right? Because they want to shop black owned and they're like, where are the black places? And I'm like, well, there are a ton. They're just, they're just not in this neighborhood, right? But we never go out to the neighborhoods where the people are because there, there's tons, there's tons of stores and there's tons of restaurants and there's all this stuff, but people are looking for it as a kind of signifier and otherwise white spaces and are finding that lacking. And so that's, it's interesting as well, the kind of spatial piece and people's imagination of what black owned or what black food should look like. They're like, oh, we don't mean the Somali place. We mean like, you know, black, black. I'm like, oh, oh, okay. I mean, it's the majority of the po- the black population here, but sure. But that's not what they're looking for. We must bring this Nordic Talks to a close. But before we do, we'd like to give the microphone to the person behind the scenes responsible for pulling this together, Persis Sparlow. Hi, everyone. So I just want to say an extra thank you, Elizabeth, Teju, Jasmine. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, your efforts. It's been amazing. And also just a reminder to the students that this talk kind of came out of conversation and conversation and community. And so if there's something on your heart and your mind that you want to bring to the stage, let's be in conversation and let's be in community. So with that, I'll bring it to a close. Thank you. Lunch will be in the back. And a last round of applause.